about Rube is that he's pretty much to everybody what they need. For example, if you need, to, you need a father figure, you need a friend, he's that person. Tell me, baby. Tell me why you do me wrong. It's like a father figure, a big brother. Um, if anything I need in the shop, he's willing to help me with. You know, some owners, they just throw you in there and let you, uh, let you sink. One of a kind dude, there's not too many people like him around anymore. Uh, he's always been there for me 100,000%, uh, teaching me the ropes of barbering. Oh God, I go back to Ruben 20 years, over 20 years. And what can I say about it? God, he got me started going back to church. He helped me through, God, so many situations. Like I said, more negative than positive. Rube always been there, just a straight up cool dude. This is more than just a barbershop to me. And I can't say enough about it. You just mean the world to me, more than you know. My name is Ruben Diagola. I'm from the Bay Area, California, born and raised. My father was a barber, always was a barber. I grew up in the barber shop. Well, after nine years working with my dad in his shop, um, you know, it was, it was, I felt that it was time for me to, to, to move on and do my own thing. And the, the reason for that is, you know, my father, he did a lot of the senior citizens and a lot of the young, I mean, the older folks. And my, my clientele was, at that time was fairly young. It, was, it started to clash, and I think you know some of the old timers started started not coming there. So I was like, you know what? It's probably time that I that I open this shop. I started, you know, I started this shop in, in, in 2004, uh, about nine years ago. I didn't really know what I was getting into. I didn't know really know what it was um, going to cost me. Uh, I know that I, you know, I, I had some money put away, and I was blessed to have family members that did a lot of construction and plumbing and stuff. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a step in faith. You know, it's it's re it really is. You know, to open your to open a new shop from scratch, it's, it it can seem overwhelming. But you know, I'm, it, it pays off in the end. You know, the things that I wanted, really wanted, and I couldn't have, I just waited. You know, I waited to get those things uh, like TVs. I just really had to start with bare bones. You know, I even you know I didn't even have sinks. You know, I had to I had to wait for sinks and and stuff like that. So. You know, little by little, over the years, you know, I built the shop to, to what it is now. So getting barbers, you know, being, being here for 11 years, we've been through a lot of different teams. I've had, uh, it started with three of us, and I've had, a, you know, one of those guys um, went on to open his own barber shop, and, you know, then I would add you know, a barber here and there, which is tough, man. You gotta, you gotta go out there, you gotta, you gotta find people, and it was kind of pre-barber, you know, blow up. You know, we're kind of in a barber boom right now, so it, it was it was a little harder back then. There's a lot more barbers now, so it's a little easier. But you know, back then it was kind of tough to get the right fits and you know the right people. Um, I started with with Hilton. He's um, he's been with me since man. He's been with me since since we opened the shop, and um, uh, I couldn't ask for a better person. I mean, he works in this chair next to me. I couldn't ask for a better person to work next to. I'm always doing something funny to somebody. So just being here in the shop, we try to just make it a good time for everybody. Because it's saying it's not work for us. This is we come here, you know, it's a family. When when clients come in, we try to make it an experience, a getaway experience. For them. So whatever they're going through, positive, negative, especially negative, we don't want them thinking about it while they're here in the shop. You know, because even for me, Coming here is, is, is therapeutic, you know what I mean, so. Then we have Troy, Troy works with me now. Uh, funny story about Troy, man, Troy, he was a little kid um, in, back in, I think it was in the, in the 90s, in the late 90s, and I remember uh, he was a client of mine, and one day he, he called me up and during the summer and he said, hey, hey Ruben, you think I can come sweep up the shop, you know, for like a, a summer job? And I said, yeah, of course, yeah, definitely, come on down. And you know, and um, Troy has been with me ever since. He's uh, he, he's now 30 years old. He's got his own family, kids, and all that. And he's been with me since he was 10 years old. So that that's been that's been amazing. And he's you know he's such a 
a good dude, man. I really like him a lot. He's, he's been with me. He's like, I, I kind of, you know, I was friends with his dad. His dad had passed away, and, and you know, and so I feel like I've kind of taken the, taking those reins, you know. Um, you know, he's, he's really like a son to me. One summer, I was about nine or ten years old. I caught Ruben up at his father's shop around the corner. Can I come work there, clean up, sweep up the shop? You know, whatever, make a couple dollars. He was like, yeah, come start on these days, whatever. So I did that for a couple of years. Then I decided to become a barber. I did the apprenticeship program. I've been here for about six years, licensed for, what, three years now? Frank is another one of my barbers, and uh, you know Frank was in a downtime of his life, and he was uh, he was on drugs, and he was uh, separated from his family. His wife uh, had divorced, and he was going through a real hard time. And I remember um, this is back when I was at my dad's shop, and I and I saw him walking across the street, and he had some jewelry. He had a jewelry stop, a jewelry um, place across the street from my dad's shop, and he had uh, this this you know same. Paul or St. Mary, something in his hand with a chain. And I was like, hey, you know, I called him over because I, you know, he, he was a client and I hadn't seen him in a while, but I knew he, what, what he was doing. You know, his, his, his wife was, you know, would come in the shop and bring their son still. And, and uh, he would, you know, um, they would tell me what, you know, what Frank was up to. And, and, I, and I remember seeing him and I said, I called him over and I said, hey, man, and, you know, and he, and he saw me. He was like, oh, man, like he was kind of ashamed. And he came, he came across the street and he said, "Hey, first thing he said, hey man, you want to buy this, buy this chain?" And he was, and he was pretty, he was pretty loaded. You could tell, man. You could tell he'd been on the street. And uh, and I looked at him. and I said, "Hey man, you got a family, dude. What are you doing? You know, what are you doing with your life right now? You know." And uh, he looked at me. He couldn't hardly really look at me in my eyes, man. He was like, man. Just like, you know, and I remember that day I took him to a detox, you know, and he didn't make it through the detox, but I'll never forget about a year and a half later he came looking for me. And I remember I was going to my church out here, I was at my church, and he actually went to the church looking for me. And uh, right after that, he, his life changed, and eventually he started you know, going, he went to barber college to become a barber, and he's, he's been here ever since. And he's doing great. He got back. Actually, he married his he married his wife for the second time, and they they look they're, they're all good now. I met Ruben about 15 years ago. He was a you know big brother, father figure in my life. I say about I met about two and a half years ago. I asked him uh, if there's any possibility of me of me coming to the shop and working. He was like, <clears throat> maybe you should just go to school and uh, you know get your license, and we'll see how it works out. As soon as I got my license, there were two spots opened up, and ever since then, my life has really truly changed. I can't uh, can't say enough about how, about how much this man has done for me. I'm just really thankful that uh, God put me in this position to. Uh, you know, excel to where I've been, from where I've been to now. And I'm just, uh, I'm really thankful, man. And, uh, God bless. My mother and my father divorced when I was about three years old. We moved to a town right here in the Bay Area called Fairfield from San Francisco. I lived in, you know, a house with my mother and my stepfather. And, you know, uh, but I was blessed, man. Uh, it, it, was, it was still a good experience, you know. I, I got lucky. I'll never forget it. It's about 1989, I started cutting hair. I, I, my dad gave me my first pair of wall clippers, some, some old janky wall clippers, man. That's all I had, some, had some wall clippers and a comb. And I started, um, you know, cutting hair in my mom's garage. You know, that's how I made my lunch money, man. I went, went in the garage and, and cut hair. And I had people lined up. and. I remember I had a basketball hoop in my backyard, so people would be waiting to shoot and move. That's why I started, you know, you know, learning my trade. It was in my garage.
this is uh, this is my the neighborhood I, I grew up in from about eight years old. We moved here in '83. This is in uh, in Fairfield, California, and uh, this is this is the house I grew up in right here. My mom's my mom my, my stepdad. I don't forget that neighbor right there on the corner. Right there, he used to get so mad if a ball would land in his in his yard, and he would chuck it all the way down that. <laughs> You chuck it all the way down the street until it hit the main street. Yeah, man, a lot of memories, a lot of memories here. I grew up, um, for, like I said, from about 83 till about 94. I, uh, I pretty much spent my whole childhood here. Yeah, it's a cool town. His lawn is tip top, man. He used to have us try to mow it, and then he'd be like, no, let me just do it myself. But like his garden, his little garden and stuff, he don't play around. Hey, 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 hey! Sonny. <laughs> How you doing? Fine, fine. Come on in. Hi. Hey. Hey. How are you doing? Get back quick. This is the house I grew up in. Uh, yeah, they, they, my parents kept it up. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's me as a young man. <laughs> The graduate. <laughs> My brothers and sisters. Oh, yeah. I can't look at my nephew too much. You know, he's scared of him or something. He screams. We saw, you know, the nice cars parked up front. I was just telling you, it wasn't always like that. You guys had to make a lot of sacrifices to just have this, this house. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. like everybody else. Yeah. Like everybody else. Yeah. I don't even like calling him my stepfather, but. <laughs> You know, he, 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 I mean, he, I couldn't have been blessed with a, with a, with a better, you know, man to, to, to raise, to raise me, you know, besides my father. He's, a, he's an awesome man, you know, and I, and I was, uh, and I always tell him I appreciate everything he's done for me and my mom too. She always, you know, everything is, everything was good, you know. We all families have their ups and downs, but you know what, we, I think all together, collectively, it was, it was, it was a good, a good childhood growing up. Yeah. The famous garage where <laughs> it doesn't look the same, everything's changed. <laughs> yeah, come on now. Open the garage room. Mm -hmm. Where it all started. I mean, like like my mom just said, the garage didn't always look like this. I mean, it, it, it's it was a you know like everybody's it garage, a, yeah, a bunch it, of stuff, a bunch of. It's typical you know, garage and, where kids are. <laughs> and I remember I would just you know set up right here. I remember I had my little setup right here, and I used to you know use the outlet, and I, this is where I would do all my haircuts right, right here in this place. They used to come home, and man, they would they'd be so pissed off at me, man. They would. <laughs> They go in the bathroom. They go in the bathroom and find hair all up in the sink, and they put up with it though. I mean, they told me I remember one time, no more. But I was, you know, back then I had I had people wanting cuts, and I remember back right here we used to have a basketball hoop, and they would they would play basketball back here, you know, while they wait while they waited for the haircuts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not only would they get a haircut, but they'd probably get a free meal, and you know. <laughs> I remember be cutting hair and somebody come out with a bowl of cereal. <laughs> Did you even ask? Did you ask? <laughs> see, y'all gonna get me in trouble. You guys know who you are. <laughs> you guys see this, you know who you are. Yeah, and I, I, know, know, and I, no and I know who they are too. <laughs> she knows who they are. I ain't saying no names. Facebook and Instagram, I ain't saying no names. And YouTube, you guys know who you are eating up on my mom's food. <laughs> And I remember one time, man, I had a guy in the chair, and you know, this is when they told me to stop. And I was cutting them, and, and the, the garage was closed. And all of a sudden, the garage started open. I said, get up out of here. You know what I mean? So he, he, he got ghost. He hit the side door, hopped the fence, and ran. You know what I mean? Yeah, I didn't even have enough time to clean up, you know? So, so I've always wanted to ask you, did you ever make any money? That's a good question. That's a good question. I, 
<laughs> you know, they, they, they would pay me a couple of dollars, but, I'm, I, no, but I remember a lot of them would be like, yeah, I'll pay you later, man. Don't worry, I got you. <laughs> I ain't never seen a dollar. And you guys owe me for that, too. You guys owe me. You know what they would say? They would say, man, you're practicing on us, man. You're practicing on us. You We're your guinea pig. Money. You can pay us. <laughs> One yeah. thing about Reuben is that everybody likes Reuben. When we moved to this neighborhood, I think he knew all the neighbors before any of us did. Mm -hmm. He would, um, yeah, he's just a really, really friendly guy and hardworking. He always, always managed to find some kind of work. Ever since he was 13 or 14, he found something to do. Aside from the fact that we did come home one day and, and you know, because he starts off cutting on in a chair and then all of a sudden we come home one day and there's a, literally a barber chair <laughs> in the garage. That was my pops. He, you know, I would always go. My pops had a garage full of stuff. I mean, barber chairs, <laughs> clippers, whatever. I mean, he. I, I mean, I would just go in and be like, take whatever you want to take. You know, I want on my weekends with him, and I'd bring him back here, and they they would find all kinds. Oh of stuff. my goodness! What is what it was like a real struggle. <laughs> but well, Ruben was going to do what Ruben wanted to do. We had <laughs> chairs like this in the kitchen, mm -hmm. similar to this. And Ruben needed some place to put his. This is before the, this is before the barber chair. Oh, yeah. Before the yeah, barber yeah. chair, yeah. So Ruben was, you know, he's very creative. So he, what he does, he saw, he gets he's my saw and he saws this <laughs> and puts his equipment in here. And we come home and uh, we find our one less chair in the kitchen. <laughs> well, because I had. Well, what happened was, what had happened was, it, I had a, a, like a nightstand that wasn't tall enough for me to put my stuff on so I, so I, so I had to I had to cut that off so I could put it on top of it <laughs> so I could so I could, you know have a real barber station well, that makes sense right I just take the picture <laughs> you know did you talk about your accident no no yeah. no in 2000 I used to ride Harleys in 2000 I bought my first Harley I was riding at night with a friend and I went down um, we were driving in a, we were riding a, a gravelly road for some reason that you know, it was really cold that night and my eyes were water I couldn't see and it, and I just for some reason I, 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 I thought someone was closer to me than they really were and I yanked my brake and, up, and I and I went I flew this way the bike flew that way and I busted both my I busted both my arms my wrists I mean you guys can still see the scars you know. I busted both both of them really bad. Yeah, and there's some more scars right there from the, you know. And the doctor told me that I would that I would lose the dexterity in my hands. And I remember being in the hospital room, looking at my wife, like, "What am I gonna do? All my livelihood is right here. My my hands to cut hair." And I remember I just broke down in that room and I cried and I cried because I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to do the things that I do. They, 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 because I shattered bones. I didn't just break bones, I shattered them. You know, so they had to literally pin all these bones together to get to, to make it right. You know, to, and even, she even said that I would suffer from arthritis later on in life. But I still haven't, I haven't, I'm, I feel good. You know, it, it's still good. I used to always tell them, you work with your hands. You cannot afford to get into an accident when you got that bike. And I don't ride a motorcycle. Mom, moms always know best. <laughs> <laughs> I kept riding for another few years, but I, you know, after a while, I, I, I laid it to rest. So you guys thought side parts was a new thing. This side parts aren't a new thing. Look, this this is 1981. Look at that side part. <laughs> Fresh. I'm call my pops man and see if he's around. I'm sure he is. Hey, Pop. Doing good, doing good. Hey, so um, I'm leaving Fairfield right now to come to, to to your shop. So I'll meet you there in about 30 minutes. Okay, Pop. Bye-bye. Hey, you guys. Yeah, I thought you guys were going to say coffee or something. <laughs> Next time we're going to do Don't know if I told you, but I think you are the love of my life. So we're on our way to my dad's shop in, uh, back in Concord. And um, one of the cool things about his shop, man, is that the building that he's in has been there since 1911, so 100 plus years. And the spot that he's in has always been a barber shop. As a matter of fact, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the classic pictures of Concord, like they have, like if you go to certain restaurants and stuff, they have 
you know, pictures from the 1930s and the 1940s with all those, you know, those kind of cars. And my dad, you can see my dad's shop. It's dope. Matter of fact, we could probably look at one of those because at the pizza place next door, they got one of those pictures. I feel so lonely, baby, when I know that you ain't around. I need you right next to me. I want to hear your every sound. shop I worked at was right out of Barber College right after I graduated. I was 19 years old um, and I started working at my dad's shop, Ruben's Barber Shop. But it's not too often where you can, you know, work with a family member like that and it, and it be cool. And, and I gotta say that most of the times it was cool, man. Me and my father had a good time working together. Lots of laughs and we laughed a lot, you know. Uh, for those of you that do work in a barbershop, you know that there's a lot of different characters and you know a lot of different people that come in, and it's just you know um, it was a good experience. I loved working with my pops. <laughs> Y'all gotta get that. Man, he's got an axe holding the door. <laughs> Look at that. This is my son Ruben. This is uh, probably the future of, of, of uh, our family tradition of barbering. Yeah. Uh, this is my oldest daughter Raina. This is my oldest, my daughter Rachel. And then my son Roman, my youngest boy. So what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah? Barber or football player? Football player? Yeah, either one is great. <laughs> if it wasn't for this barbershop, if it wasn't for you, you guys right here. None of, none of these kids would be here, man. If he didn't give me a chance, he's the one that gave me a shot. You know? Yeah. I know it's a father's son, but yeah. he's still giving me. If, if it wasn't for him, I didn't even know the shop was here. I wouldn't be where I am today. This was my station too. That's where I, this is where I this is where I cut for nine years. It's nice to have my son in the business because it keeps me going. Without him, I, I'd be lost. I'd be lost in the business because uh, guys my age, they they don't know, they're not paid. Yeah. I remember one time. There's, you see so many people. I remember one time. This guy came in as one of my dad's clients. He's a tall guy. His name was Dick. I never remember. I'll never forget. Oh yeah. And he come in. He sits in my dad's chair and he says, "Hey, Ruben." And you know, he's just like, "Hey, how you doing, Dick?" And he's like, "Well, it's probably gonna be my last haircut. My doctor doesn't give me too much longer to live." I was Wednesday. I was at a, at a funeral home on Friday. He just come to say goodbye. Yeah. He came and got his last haircut, man. And he knew he was on his way out. Yeah. He walked in by himself or left by himself? Yeah. I, then I seen him Friday in the casket. And then he went to his, yeah. yeah. It's crazy, man. Yeah. It's a business that's been passed down from generation to generation. My, my grandmother owned, owned a, a beauty parlor, a salon, in, in, in the Mission District of San Francisco. And, um, you know, my dad, he started cutting hair, you know, when he was in his early 20s. He, um, he started working at a shop in San Francisco, his cousin Richard's shop. It's called Still There Too, Richard's Barber Shop. You know, this ain't, this ain't San Francisco. He was in the financial district. Yeah. This is the shop that he was in right here. Right in the middle of the financial district right here. It's one of those shops where you, you know, the old gangster movies, the old gangster movies were, you know, would be would have been yeah. real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, this is where. This is where all began. This is where the professional. 20 years ago. 20 years already. I met this woman right yeah. here in this Right here, shop. right where uh, yeah. Rachel City. Right where my daughter sitting. This is where I met her. And, uh, you know, we've been together ever since. And uh, we haven't left each other's side. Uh, strong woman right here. Yeah, strong woman. We heard a lot of good things. Yeah. <laughs> I have uh, I have a, a beautiful wife of uh, going on 16 years married. We've been together about 18 years all together. She actually came in with one of uh, my cousins that she used to hang out with. She came she came in with her and uh, and she was real cute, nice to flirt with her. And, you know, just one day we just you know 
we started talking on the phone. This is before cell phones and stuff. We, when people, before texting, when people used to still talk on the phone, and man, we've been together ever since. After, you know, after we started the shop here, business was, I mean, it was booming. I mean, it was at its height. We bought a house, we bought cars, we bought my Harleys, and, and then we decided to buy another house, you know, and rent and have one for rental, and everything was good, and then in about 2007, the housing market crashed, and we lost both of our houses. I lost my cars, I lost my motorcycles. I lost everything. Um, everything was gone. And I remember I found myself, me and my family, my four kids, we lived in a hotel. We lived in a hotel for about three months. And in the midst of all that, my wife started getting really sick, and we didn't know what was wrong. I just knew that something wasn't right, you know. I knew something wasn't right. You know, finally, after about a month of her just being sick, she, she went to the, to the doctor finally, and they told us that she had stage 3B cancer. And that was a blow. I mean, on top of everything, on top of losing everything, I mean, that was, that was crazy. It was, that was, I can't even explain. I mean, um, the feeling that you have when you get that kind of news, you know, you just don't know exactly how to deal with it. And, and the only thing I knew was my faith in God, and that's what I grasped onto. And to see my wife go through, it's hard going back to that. To see my wife go through chemotherapy treatments and radiation treatments. Oh man, that's tough. It's tough. It was tough. It's tough for me. It's tough for my children. I remember sitting. I remember one time I was. We were still, still living in a hotel. And then, you know, the hotel we lived in, they had a little, a little happy hour where you can get food and stuff. And before my wife got sick, you know, we would all go there together. And I remember being at that table with my four kids without her. And I remember looking across the table. Had an empty chair. I didn't know if I would ever see her at that chair again, but you know, and that was tough. That was tough. That was tough. Well, by the grace of God, she's good. You know, I believe that God healed her. You know, she has been six years cancer free. She's a strong woman, strongest woman I've ever, I've ever seen in my life. She's been through a lot of stuff. You know, in six years, my wife has had, from the, let's start from the beginning, 10 blood transfusions. She's had radiation, chemotherapy, another form of radiation that was just unreal. She had, I think, up to like 12 surgeries. She's had, you know, so many different discomforts and craziness that we would just, like, I think us as men would just, we would have just called it quits, man. Because, I mean, I, I can't take being sick or, or taking pain like that. And she was, just, and she just, I mean, she, she roughed through it, man. And I'll tell you what, I just thank God to this day that, you know, he gave me a wife like that and someone strong like that, man. Cause I know, I, I know, I, I don't think I could have, I could have did it. You know, she was a strong, strong woman. Through all that, you know, it's, it's funny. And, and 
this is one of the things that I love about this business, you know, being in the barbershop, it, 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 it helped me get through this. You know, just, just talking with people and then having, you know, people, you know, console you when you needed it. Through all those things, you know, the things that were standing were my faith in God, my family, and my barbershop. That's what stood. And those are the three things that mean the most to me. understand that you know music is its own like reward it's its own you know it's whether you're playing it you know in that little music shop that we were playing it in or you know in front of thousands of people you know regardless you do it because you love it and I know I know a lot of musicians a lot of um, musicians that are full-time musicians all they do and they always told me man you know what if you're a musician you don't make a lot of money unless you make it big, like in the pop scene, like, you know, you know, like the Black Eyed Peas or, you know, Lady Gaga, Madonna, all that type of stuff. I mean, that's the only time you really, you know, you, Justin Bieber, those kind of people, those are the ones that become millionaires. But, you know, you know, but like you guys see, I mean, they're, they're molding into what they want you to be, you know. And once you stop doing what you love and why you loved it, you know, in the first place, then it becomes something else. It, become, it doesn't become, it's not the, the music that you that you loved at, at first. And that's what I see a lot, especially, in, I mean, you guys see this in barbering. A lot of barbers, you know, are in this for, I mean, you see it, they're in this for like this glam, you know what I mean? This, the, to be famous and to, and, 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 you know, and some people, you know, you, they have the opportunities and they take them and they roll it and that's fine, but it's like, a lot of, I can see a lot of the youngsters coming up and they just want the fame. They want, you know what I mean? And and once you get that, I think that takes away from the actual servers of what you're doing. You know, barbering is about serving people. So the MC for the prototype group with the Black Eyed Peas actually went to my church and I play guitar and sing at church. And, and uh, just one day, you know, he, he was like, hey man, we're doing this project. You know, with the Black Eyed Peas, and you know, it's a possible tour involved and stuff. And, you know, I like what you do. You know, uh, on guitar, and so I was like, Shh, I didn't want to pass that one up. I mean, that was that's a good opportunity, and I got to rub elbows with some with some with some folks, man. Especially going to L.A. and stuff, you you get to rub elbows with you know everybody's in L.A. So well, I am. We did the West Coast tour with them. There was you know with um, Ludacris and. Um, What's that crazy group with the big hair? LMFAO. Them guys were crazy. They were cool though. They were real. Everybody was really cool. I had to be in LA a lot. So I used to go to LA, play music, man, do like these shows. Cause I played lead guitar for them. And we, had, we did these shows and and uh, and then I would have to come back, you know, to go back to the shop, you know? So it was crazy. <laughs> it's, it's cool though, man. And that's, that is me singing. This is riding music, you know what I mean? Cause I it's funny, blues is an old music, but it's something that everybody can relate to. Everybody's everybody's been hurt, everybody's you know, been through their their their, their breakups and stuff like that. That's why it's it's it, it's a, it's an emotional style of music, you know. One of the really cool things about the music industry and stuff like that is getting radio play. And I remember, you know, we got, um, when I was with the blues band, uh, Junior DeVille is, was my stage name. Because uh, I'm Ruben Junior, and not everybody could say my last name, so I just, DeVille was like, you know, I saw it on the Cadillac, I was like, that'll work. 
We got to um, get on uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd from the Blues Brothers, his radio show. That radio show, man, it got, uh, I mean, everywhere in the country and even outside of, like, you know, like even in Puerto Rico and all the American, you know, Commonwealth country, in Hawaii. I got so much, they got so much radio playing. That was, that was really cool, man. And to be on his show, you know, introducing the song, that was really exciting for us. We, we all stayed. I remember the night that we, um, the night that we uh, knew that we were going to be on it, we all, came, and it was, it was later at night. Because it was on a, it was on a, um, uh, a radio station out here called K-Fog, and their blues hour is like at 10 o'clock at night. So we all waited, and we were all together in the room, and we, we heard him come, you know, come in, Junior the Blues, you know, <laughs> it was cool, man. Yeah, this is the radio show. Junior DeVille's been making quite a name for himself in many Northern California blues clubs. With a magical stage presence and a strong band behind him, Junior offers up a combination of searing guitar solos and soul-filled vocals. His new 2003 release, Just a Blues Cat, further proves that Junior will be a force to be reckoned with in years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to bring you this week's blues breaker from Junior DeVille. Here is No More Crying. When you left me, babe, I didn't know what to do And then I thought to myself, I ain't nobody's fool, yeah, hey, hey I ain't crying no more I done wiped to my tears and now it's time for me to get a good low I don't need you, babe, I just find by myself And if I need someone, babe, then I'll find someone else, yeah, hey, hey 